So do you think that it is essentially the war in Ukraine kind of a a war for the norm that you can't just invade your neighbor? It, it yes. seems like I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's kind of like if we if we defeat Putin in Ukraine, then it says, hey, trust is more important here. You can't do that. Everybody who's thinking about doing that, don't do it because we will unite and, and face you down. It's going to be the end of your regime or you're just going to be in the meat grinder. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, for, for yeah. thousands of years, this was the human norm. Kind of humans lived in the jungle. For thousands of years, whether you live in ancient Greece or ancient China or medieval Europe or the 19th century, you know that at any moment, the neighboring tribe, the neighboring kingdom, the neighboring country might invade and conquer you. Everybody knows it. This is kind of the, the, the basics of, of, of history or the basics of international relations. And over the last few decades, it changed. Um, it became unacceptable for one country to invade and annihilate a neighbor just because it can. We still had lots of, uh, lots of wars, but of a different kind. You had a lot of civil wars, you had a lot of uh, uh, internal conflicts. But since 1945, there has not been a single case of an internationally recognized country which is just wiped off the map because a stronger neighbor invaded and conquered it. And this was reflected, for instance, in a, a decline in military budgets because all countries felt much safer. And now this new norm is broken. And if Putin gets away with it, then it will, uh, will return to the jungle, basically. Then countries all over the world will know that this is again possible. You know, it's like in a school when some bully beats up a, a child, a, a kid in, 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 in the yard, and everybody is kind of forming a circle to see what happens. <laughs> If the bully is stopped and punished, so you know, oh, you can't do these things. You can't behave like that. But if the bully gets away with it, then every kid in school knows that this is the new norm of the school. It can also happen to me. So uh, I need to take care of myself. And taking care of myself in terms of international relations, for instance, means increasing your military budget mm -hmm. or entering into military alliances which of course impacts your neighbors. Because if you increase your military budget, they now feel less safe, so they increase their budget, and you have this arms race spiral again, which ultimately harms everybody. Do you think we're likely to see an increase in the proliferation of nuclear weapons? I mean, you, a lot of people are saying, well, Ukraine yeah. gave up their nukes in exchange for security, and that didn't really work. Absolutely. Again, if you live in the jungle, you want to have the biggest teeth. And uh, um, certainly, when, when you think about the history of Ukraine, that after it gained its independence, it voluntarily gave up its nuclear weapons in exchange for these promises of protection, both from Russia and from the United States and, and the Western powers. And then it was invaded by Russia, and the Western powers said, OK, we, we, are, we are not going, we are helping mm -hmm. you in many ways, but we are not sending our armies to help you. So all other countries in the world, again, are watching this. And the conclusion is, if we have nuclear weapons, don't give them up. No matter what guarantees you get, they won't be worth much in, in times of trouble. And it's in the countries that don't have nuclear weapons, at least some of them are likely to want to get some. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you, if you think about even, I don't know, like the post-war arrangements after 1945, so both Germany and Japan, even though they had the ability to acquire nuclear weapons, they certainly have the technological and the economic resources necessary to produce nukes. They uh, gave up this, uh, uh, this option, trusting in the United States to a large extent to provide them with a nuclear umbrella. Now, what happens, for instance, if in 2024 or 2028, a, a, a new US president is elected who opts for a very isolationist foreign policy, and basically um, Germany or Japan or other countries can no longer rely on the Americans to, to provide them with security. 
So at, even though at present it seems almost unthinkable that Germany or Japan would go nuclear, um, depending on you know, the outcome of the next US elections, this can be a, a, a real development. Yeah, that that is scary, regardless of what you think about who's in charge of those nukes, right? Just proliferation in general is always should give everybody a, some pause. Absolutely. I've heard you say I've heard you say that if Putin waited 10 more years, maybe he might have gotten away with invading Ukraine because it, the you West would have collapsed. West, yeah, uh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say you didn't say the West would have collapsed, <laughs> but there we go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you look yeah. at, the, at, the, at the culture war within the West within the United States, within European countries. And the impression is if, 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 if Putin and, and, and just left the West alone to uh, you know, go down with, with, with this culture war, um, he could have then done whatever he wanted. And I think that the, the biggest threat to the West and to a large extent even to the peace of the world is, is internal. Because the Western powers are still by far the most a uh, 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 powerful block on the planet. You look both militarily and also culturally and economically, if Western democracies stand together, um, they are much more powerful than Russia. They are even significantly more powerful than China. You know, the, the, the Russian GDP is about the same as Italian GDP. In economic mm -hmm. term, if you take Belgium and the Netherlands together, that's Russia. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Wow. But the, 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 the West's biggest problem is internal, is this culture war which is tearing the West apart. And, you know, this is extremely unfortunate because I think basically almost all sides in the culture war, they agree on the same basic values, on the same basic worldview. Looking from outside, it's really difficult to understand what the uh, 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 big fight is all about. You know, looking from outside, the difference, for instance, between Republicans and Democrats in the United States doesn't look very significant. They all agree on basic values like freedom, like democracy, uh, like equality. If we talked earlier about humanism, you know, for most of history, so people believed in the divine right of, of monarchs. Uh, and the big political battle in the 19th century, for instance, was between people who believed in the divine rights of kings to rule and uh, uh, the will of the people, democratic elections. This is no longer, uh, as, I mean, Democrats and Republicans are in exactly the same camp. They both believe in democracy, in the will of the people. It's the same with the economy. They both believe in the free market. Yes, they have some, you know, from a historical perspective, relatively small differences in the level of taxation they want. But it's not like in the early 20th century where you have a communist camp that wants to completely abolish private property. Nobody is talking in these extremist terms. So economically also, the difference between Democrats and Republicans is not so big. Uh, even if you look at, 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 at things like, I don't know, gay marriage, so Republicans today hold much more liberal views than Democrats held 50 years ago. Yeah, or, or 20 years ago, I think, wasn't even Hillary Clinton was like, well, I don't know. And that was, <laughs> that was like a minute, five minutes ago in, in a historical timeline. So it, it seems that people are, are, are taking certain uh, uh, flashpoint issues, which are important in themselves, of, of course, like abortion, like gun control, like transgender rights. And in a way, you know, kind of, uh, uh, um, uh, weaponizing them and taking them to extreme in order to create this political polarization, um, which looked at from a broader perspective, th there just seems such a mismatch between the, 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 the issues people are fighting over and mm -hmm. what is at stake. Because what is at stake is really now the, the collapse of American democracy. What is at stake is the survival of, uh, of, 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 of the, the, the Western bloc, maybe even the survival of humankind, because if we don't have unity in the world, then we won't be able to solve climate change and the threat of AI and so forth. And to risk all that because of arguments 
over who can go to which toilet. It, this, this, <laughs> seems, this seems just, just in, incredible. You know, if, if we approach these uh, uh, hot topics, not with an intention of weaponizing them, but with goodwill, all of them, people can reach compromises. Nobody would get everything they want, but they are all issues that people can actually compromise on because they are not, you know, the most fundamental issues for the survival of the community or of the country.